Oh, hello! My name is Mara, and welcome to Books Like Woe. I survived February! Yay! So, if you've not been following along with me, February was the month that I moved from my old townhouse to my new house. It's the first house I've ever owned. I feel like an adult. Not that that actually makes you an adult, like, at all, but milestone, I guess, in terms of like my goals. More so just that I found a city in a neighborhood that I like enough that I actually wanted to buy in because I've always been kind of a little restless. I've moved, I think, how many cities have I lived in in my adult life? Five or six cities in the last 10 years? Like I've moved a lot um, for work and for school and stuff. So it feels good to feel like I have a place that I want to like put down some real roots. I absolutely love Nashville and it's a good um, kind of situation for me in terms of like, my family situation, my professional goals, and just overall like my values and um, the kind of place that I want to live. So I'm really glad to be moved in now. I am moved in. I just have to like finish doing the last the last few like random things, but yeah, I'm, I'm moved in. So I mentioned all that only because it definitely did impact my reading situation this month, which is I definitely didn't read as much. Now compared to, so I moved from Charlotte to Nashville in February last year, and I think I only read eight books that month. This month I did read 13, so I read more. Thank God for audio, because it helped me get through some things. But also just, it was like such a less stressful move than that last one, somewhat because I was only moving two miles away, so that helped, but also just like, yeah, it was a, it was a much, I'm in a much better place and it was less stressful all around. So um, yeah, I got more reading done than last year, not as much as I normally would, but still 13 books in a month is like nothing to sneeze at. So anyway, um, all that being said, <laughs> all that rambling about uh, my life, I'll go ahead and talk about some of my stats and then we will talk about my disappointments, my surprises and my hits for the month. So stat wise, like I said, I did read 13 books this month. So yay me. Uh, in terms of the format, it was mostly ebooks. I read like seven ebooks, two physical books, and four audiobooks. So, pretty good mix there. You can see on the screen now, I assume, the mix of kind of where I got things from. Majority were from Audible, because I had a lot, I, all four of the audio picks I had were um, past Audible picks. Good job, me making some dent into my Audible TBR. I also did read some from publishers, like I read a few ARCs this month, I read a few from Amazon a couple from the library. Nice little mix of that. In terms of genre spread, I read a lot of mystery. I think I read like five mysteries this month. A couple of contemporary romances, a couple of like kind of just general nonfiction, some memoirs, some sci-fi, like nice little spread, though the concentration definitely was in mystery. And then in terms of like the number of pages and stuff, so I think I read about 3,900 to 4,000 pages. My average book length was 306 pages, I think. And then the average age of the book was 18 years, which is great. My goal is to have at least 10 years old as my goal, just because that gives me a sense that I'm not just reading front list all the time. So 18 years was great. What was not so great is the average length of time a book had been on my TBR was 22 months. And I like to try to keep that closer to six months. So ups and downs there. And then finally, in terms of ratings, uh, actually a really solid month. My average rating was 3.54 which is great. If I hit at least a three, I consider it a good month. So 3.54 is an excellent reading month. I had five four-star books, which again, very solid. One 4.5 star book, which we'll definitely talk about. Uh, one two star, and then like a couple of threes and 3.5. So yeah, all around a really solid reading month, especially considering how crazy it was. Um, it didn't feel like I, you know, the way I think about if it was a good reading month in terms of how much I read, I judge that by like, if I wanted to read, could I sit down and focus on it and actually do it? And I definitely didn't, I wasn't able to read as much as I wanted to. Like when I was in the mood to read, I often just couldn't focus. So in that sense, it wasn't a great reading month, but like by the numbers, especially given the circumstances, you know, very solid, good job me. Okay, so let's talk about my disappointments first. Oh my gosh, you guys, my new neighbor just walked by and she has a standard poodle. I've always wanted one of those. In terms of disappointments this month, I think I already talked, I only had two. I talked about one of them already in my mid-month wrap up, which was Memory and Death. It was a, another entry in the In Death series. It wasn't terrible, it just was a three star. It wasn't one of the better ones and therefore it was disappointing. I feel like structurally it was a little weird. The actual like 
murder meat. That was a weird phrase coming out of my mouth. The meat of the plot, which was a murder mystery, didn't really get going until like a third of the way into the book. And I just think for a procedural, that's a little late in the game. So it wasn't my favorite of the series, but um, yeah, you know, that's just part of serialized fiction. There are ups and downs. That was a three star. Then my two star, which was genuinely my most disappointing one, was 99% Mine by Sally Thorne, which was one of the two contemporary romances I read this month. And it was disappointing because um, Sally Thorne has been very hyped up in terms of The Hating Game. That was her debut and it was a huge hit. People really, really liked it. And I have not read it because it's an enemies to lovers trope, which is just something that is not my favorite. I know a lot of people really like it. It's just not my personal trope preference. And I always, when I'm reading a new author, like to give them the best shot possible of me enjoying them. So if I can, I like to kind of wait and find a trope combo that's gonna work better for me. And 99% Mine was like friends to lovers and also like best friend of your sibling getting together like that kind of thing and I, I usually like that because it usually brings out a lot of family dynamics and there was also a house reno which is another thing that I really like as a backdrop so everything about this should have been something I liked but the authorial voice was insufferable and particularly our main character and her twin were horrible people who I didn't want to be happy like, I just didn't like them at all. <laughs> they were awful. So she has a fraternal twin brother. They're terrible together and she's falling in love with his best friend and the best friend is awesome. And I'm like, ditch both of these losers and go find someone else. Anyway, I just really, I, I really struggled with what I think the author was trying to communicate as a snarky, fun, sassy internal monologue. Like it wasn't fun, it wasn't sassy, it wasn't enjoyable. It was just, I for me, it really rubbed me the wrong way. And I'm looking at, gen I was looking at the reviews. It seems like the general consensus is people don't like this one as much as the first one, but few of them are pointing out the tone. So that's making me think, and then like when I've heard people talk about what they like about The Hating Game, some of it is that they like the tone. So I'm just thinking that Sally Thorne is not gonna be an author that works for me. I'd be interested if you've read both, if you agree with the kind of general consensus that The Hating Game was better, and if you think that the snarkiness in The Hating Game is different than what it is in 99% Mine, but I really did not enjoy this and don't think that I'll continue reading from that author. I just, it wasn't like terribly written or anything. It just wasn't for me. It didn't click for me. Okay, then moving into a couple of surprises. First, Benti, the trilogy bind up. I got that as an arc from the publisher. And I talked a little bit about this in my mid-month wrap up, so I won't say too much more. I'll just say that I think I was surprised at how hyped this was, that while the writing is really good and I like the world building and the characters, I think as individual stories and even as an overall arc there's just some real plotting issues like in terms of structure like the that's what it is the underlying structure of these novellas and then how they work together i think is really lacking and in that respect it surprised me just because this has been so hyped and so like award-winning and whatever um i enjoyed it it wasn't that i didn't enjoy it i gave a 3.5 to the overall bind up. I, it just wasn't what I was expecting, to be honest. And I think my I think my expectations were too high for it. So it, it surprised me the what I read versus the way people talk about it, basically. Still enjoyed it, just not as good as the hype for me. The other surprise that I had, it wasn't, I guess the surprise was just like the content is so unnerving and surprising. And that is Identity Crisis by John Sides. And like, there's like a few different authors. Basically, this is a group of political scientists who are like statisticians who are unpacking polling data from the 2018, 2012, and 2016 presidential elections here in the US and talking about how, like the ways in which the election of Donald Trump was or was not surprising given the polling data that we had and like the emerging trends um, from that polling data in terms of like identity politics and a few different things. That's why it's called Identity Crisis. It is a fascinating book and the results of it are very surprising because I think a lot of what it's doing is sort of deconstructing some of these sort of like explanatory narratives people have come up with about why Trump won. Some of which I think will like debunking things on both the left and the right. That's I think what's so interesting and surprising about this book is that some of the sort of truths that came out um, about why he was elected. I think that they do a really good job of breaking down and say like, no, if you look at the polling data of like who was voting for Barack Obama versus Trump versus Bernie Sanders versus Hitler, like all these different people and you break down their attitudes, 
this actually is consistent in a lot of ways with what the election of Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012 did for solidifying certain voting groups understanding of their own identities. Kind of I think the biggest thing that has come out of this book and people talking about it is that white blue collar voters prior to Barack Obama being elected did not necessarily know that Democrats are more associated with racial justice and reform and that even though Barack Obama talked about racial attitude like things having to do with race less than Hillary Clinton did his existence as the front of the Democratic Party solidified for that group of voters that Democrats are associated in some way with being for minority rights and for some white blue collar voters that pushed them towards the Democratic Party and for a lot of others it pushed them away. So essentially what they're arguing is that this wasn't like an emergence of a new attitude, it was allowing voters to better sort parties into their existing attitudes. Anyway, it's a fascinating book. It's very dry. I wouldn't call this like a page turner, but it worked well as audio of like kind of in the podcast mode um, in terms of like delivering information. And I was glad I read it. I think that it definitely gave me a more nuanced and complicated understanding of the American electorate. And I think it does raise a lot of suggestions about like where different parties could go in the future. Okay, and then moving into hits, I have two fiction and two nonfiction. So let's start with the two fiction. I also talked about both of these at my mid-month wrap up, so not go into as much detail, but first is Howard's End. This was the pick for my classics book club at my local independent bookstore. And I'm so glad that they picked this. This is one that I've always wanted to read. And I have to say, I really love this. This was just, in terms of like, when you talk about a book that's ahead of its time, um, I would definitely put this in that category. It feels incredibly relevant for our current political moment, like across the globe really, because a lot of what it's reckoning with is the, like kind of emerging class differences and wealth gap things. It's also incredibly feminist in a lot of ways. And I think that the author has a lot of ins, like I just really enjoyed kind of the, the discussion of social norms around gender and sexuality and, hypocrisy of kind of the old social order. Um, this is definitely a book like kind of, something like a Jane Eyre where you read this and feel like this feels so, like the ideas in it are, it amazes me that this was being written in the time that it was. Do you know what I mean? So like this, I really enjoyed it. And it's also, it's not very long. It's pretty easy to get through and it's a very enjoyable book. Also, it has like a plot twist at the end that is like high key savage and comes out of nowhere. Um, we spent a lot of time in our book club kind of talking about, about that part of it. But yeah, I would definitely recommend this. If This is something I would definitely put on the list like at some point, probably this year, I'm gonna make a list of like approachable classics or like places to start with classics. I would definitely put this on here because I think the the kind of underlying attitudes and ideas are so modern in a lot of ways. And uh, this definitely makes me wanna read Maurice from Ian Forrester. So Ian Forrester was um, at minimum uh, bi, but probably better described as a gay man. And, and Maurice is a, is a gay love story that was published after his death. And um, just based on how he handles like gender and sexuality things in this, I would definitely be interested in reading that. So really like this four stars. The only thing that kept it from being at, like amazing to me was that the relationship between Meg and Henry, I just fundamentally didn't buy and I felt like was too much of a plot contrivance. Um, also the, well, I can't really get into the very end, but like the situation and relationship that set up the kind of ending engine of the book, plot engine of the book, I also was just like, where did that come from? <laughs> so. There was a little bit of kind of like, it felt a little too much like deus ex machina and some of the relationship dynamics. But aside from that, I really enjoyed this and would highly recommend. Then, Say You're Sorry by Karen Rose. I actually got this as a e-arc from the publisher, but I liked it so much and want to continue in the series that I went ahead and picked up a physical copy because I really enjoyed this. So this is, I thought this was gonna be kind of like a cozier version of a thriller. It is not. It is like hardcore, like there is some like dark shit in here. Think serial killer, think ser serial killer with like a sexual component to his stuff. There's also going to be over the course of the series, clearly what's being set up is an arc about cults that's really interesting, but also dark. Um, so trigger warning, like all the content warnings on this basically that you might think could be in this kind of book, like they're here. So warning on that. I really, really liked this. I just thought it was, um, time moves in a really interesting way in this. Like this is a 500 something page book and it's like, it takes place over the course of like three days. So like 
Time is drawn out in an interesting way that I actually kind of enjoy. I really liked all the friend dynamics in this. So um, all of her books, from what I can tell, follow interconnected characters. So it moves like from city to city and it's not like you necessarily see all the characters from past books in this book, but you definitely get allusions to past stories. And I think like, she always uses, she kind of just uses the momentum and the relationship she sets up in a given book to drive into the next one, which I think is an interesting approach to a series. Um, this is the beginning of a new one in Sacramento. So like I said, that we're going to find out more about the cult. This is also a romantic thriller, a romantic suspense. I really liked the relationship between Daisy and Gideon in this. Um, it was a little insta lovey, like a little bit, but I, I went with it. I bought it. She sold me on it, basically. So I liked that. I liked her like overt subversion of some of the the things, like more gross tropes that sometimes emerge in these. Like at one point the hero like has a moment of think, I forget exactly what it was. It was something to the effect of like, you know, she wasn't even wearing something provocative and she got attacked. And then he like checks himself and is like, fuck that, it doesn't matter if she was. Like she wasn't asking for this. That's a ridiculous thing to think. And like, you can tell the author is clearly like subverting your trope. And I like, I like that. I like the, the, you know, kind of taking a normal beat in a thriller and turning it on its head a little bit. I like that the heroine doesn't really want protection, but she literally thinks to herself, I'm not too stupid to live. So like, I'm gonna take it, even though I kind of resent it for these reasons having to do with her backstory. So like, I just really, I liked the sensibility in this. I liked the characters, I liked the writing, and I liked where the overall series is going. I gave this four stars. I would definitely recommend if you're looking for sort of like thrill, like this would be a good like plain kind of book. Do you know what I mean? Like it just moves along in a nice clip and it was hard. It was, let's put it this way. It was something I didn't like putting down. Like I wanted to just keep going in it because I found it really compelling. It was very propulsive in the narrative, I think. I don't know if any of that made sense, but I recommend this and I'm excited to continue in the series. Gave this four stars, really liked it. Okay, and then my two nonfiction picks. So the first is a four star book and that was Lower Ed by Tressie McMillan Cottom. I read this, I got this as audio a couple of months ago um, because it had been recommended to me when I was working at a university of like, oh, this is a really good sociological study. And then Tressie McMillan Cottom had a personal essay collection called Thick that came out. If you saw my wrap up last month, the narrative voice in it just didn't quite work for me even though I loved the content. And I was like, well, and I kept hearing her interviewed everywhere in support of that. And I always really like listening to her talk. And I was like, oh, like I want to read something from her that I'm really going to like. So I went ahead and listened to Lower Ed since that, you know, was more kind of like straight nonfiction. Like it was um, a sociological study and I liked it much better. Like her authorial voice in that genre of nonfiction works a lot better for me. And it was also just fascinating. Basically, this is a sociological study of why the boom of the for-profit college in the US and like how that's become a thing and has fascinating reflections on sort of how that is uh, symptomatic of our overall shift as a culture from responsibility from institutions to provide safety nets for people to the individual and kind of the erosion of our overall like kind of public institutions. I thought that that was really interesting. I really appreciated her unpacking like the complicated reasons why people choose to seek out for-profit education and that it's not a situation. I think kind of the way it's portrayed is like, oh, these are like just conning people into these schools that aren't real. And yes, there definitely is some of that and she unpacks that, but she also talks about people who are essentially are using this as a way to get um, student loans to start their own businesses, basically. Like it's a way for people who don't have access to capital to get loans. She talks about people who are highly aware of the credentialing aspect of it and the fact that most people, like especially depending on what the institution is called may not realize it's a for-profit institution and then they can have MBA at the end of their name and that will help them get a better job or whatever. Like I think she really complicates kind of the narrative around who the for-profit college student is in a way that I really appreciated and it, it really made me reflect on kind of like where we are in the job market. I'm in a position now where I help with hiring and I think it made me kind of even though the types of positions that I'm hiring for tend to be ones that require more experience wouldn't necessarily be looking at a lot of the the types of degrees that are offered by these colleges it did make me kind of reflect on like what are my assumptions about candidates when i'm looking at their credentials and like how important really are credentials versus 
their experience. So anyway, it was just a really thought provoking book that was really well done. And I was very excited to have found a book that I got along with better from Tressie McMillan Cotton because I like her so much that I was happy to have liked one of her books so well. Finally, my 4.5 star book of the month that was definitely my favorite thing I read. And it's just really, really good. And I, I kind of knew it would be just because of my experience with her on YouTube and her channel and also just what I've heard people say about the book. But that was Smoke Gets In Your Eyes and Other Stories from the Crematoria by Caitlin Doherty and I just love this. This is exactly what I like in a memoir of this type which is I learned a lot about her profession which is that she is a mortician and this is basically kind of a memoir of her kind of coming into the industry and her early experiences and her time in mortuary school and sort of how those formed her and uh, into the kind of um, mortician that she is now. And so like the things I was learning about their profession were fascinating and I really enjoyed that and, and really appreciated her ability to bring humor to things that are very grim. There's a lot of gallows humor in this. I do think I need to give a specific warning. So if you don't wanna read about like what happens to dead bodies, don't read this. And then specifically, she does talk in particular about um, how the bodies of dead infants are treated or dead children. And I think that could be something particularly upsetting to people. So I just want to flag that that is in this book. I think she has good reflections on that. So I don't think it's handled. I think it's handled well, but that might be something depending on where you are in your life that you may not want to read about. So I just want to flag that in particular. But I thought she handled all of the more graphic elements in a way that had it did have some gallows humor to it. But it also I think always had a fundamental respect to it. So um, I, it's not glib, if that makes sense. So she handled all of that piece really well. But then she also brings just really, I think, well chosen and incisive moments of personal reflection on her own relationship with her mortality, with kind of like existential, like, why am I here kind of things that that I think she was grappling with and kind of drove her to get into the industry. And I really appreciated the personal parts of this memoir a lot more than I was expecting to. And um, I found them really moving. Maybe that's the bottom line. I think she communicates them in a way that's very moving and very, I think it. this is a book that really invites the reader to reflect on their own relationship with death. And I read this book um, as I was cleaning out my old place. And it was the week that the six month mark since my father passed away pretty suddenly and suddenly because of the specific circumstances, but he had prior been very, um, he'd been, he'd had cancer and he beat it. That's why the circumstances of his actual death were kind of startling. But anyway, um, while he was sick, I was watching her YouTube channel a lot, which is called Ask a Mortician. And it was really helpful to me in terms of sort of like, I was in this place where I was really making peace, not only with the death of my father, but or the possible at that point death of my father and his his mortality, but it makes you reflect on your own. You know, my friend had also died. And I think I was in a kind of two to three year period that I'm just now coming out of of really reckoning with the fact that like, I'm not going to be here forever. And like, if you're not going to be here forever, then you, you've got to figure out what you're going to do with the time that you have. And I think her frank discussion of the end of life and like what happens in that was something I really needed as a way to kind of make peace with and like get comfortable with both the mortality of my parent, but also my own mortality. And I think reading that I didn't even realize it until I was I had a very emotional moment. And I realized like, oh, it's because I think subconsciously, I know that this is the six month mark. But I think I, I gravitated towards it unconsciously, because I knew that I needed it. But I think that it was just sort of a nice sorry, I'm reflecting on my own life. Now, I'm moving into a period now, I think, kind of a different season of life. And I think that book was a nice sort of like capstone of like that transition. And so I think on a personal level, it hit me in the right place. But I also just think objectively as a book, as a memoir, it is really excellent and something that I would highly recommend to you. So that was a lot about that book. Read it. I really enjoyed it. I highly recommend it. That's the bottom line. If you can deal with like kind of, you know, thinking about your own mortality and death and all that stuff, highly recommend this one. Oh, and before I go, I should, I'm trying to get better about saying about how I'm doing on my challenges. So in terms of my 19 books that I want to read in 2019, including my TBR mug, I did not get to Bayou Moon, which I don't think is surprising given that I was moving this month, but I'm going to try to get to that before my next check-in so that 
at least I've done it before the next check-in. So I didn't get to that. I did read two in-depth books, which was less than I'd wanted to read, but honestly, I think I'm finding that about two a month is as much as I can do, so I may have to adjust my plans accordingly. I did read Howard's End, which is a classic, so I read a classic this month. And I think that those are most of the challenge related things. So yeah, that's how I did on my challenges this month. So that wraps up my March reading. Um, I do want to let you guys know that in the course of moving, I think I had a, a good little moment of reflection of like, I'm putting a lot of pressure on myself to post consistently three times a week on here. And that got to be a little stressful during the move. And I think that I'm going to give myself permission if life is happening and I just can't get to that third upload, I'm not going to necessarily I, I said this at the beginning when I went to this this schedule of like I definitely will have two and then when I can I'll have a third and I think I've so consistently been able to give a third that I mentally expected or like put the expectation on myself that I always have to do that and I think I just need to formally give myself permission and let you guys know that if there's a week where it's just not happening then the Friday video may not go up because I just need to give myself a little bit more flexibility in terms of like other responsibilities. And I want to make sure that this stays something fun for me and never something that feels like a chore because this is my hobby. So this should be fun. <laughs> so I just want to let you guys know, you may not always be seeing that third video from me from now on. I'll try to remember to post on like Twitter or on my community tab if that's not going to happen. But anyway, just FYI, a little programming note. But other than that, I hope you guys had a great uh, February reading month. I think that will do it for me. Let me know anything that you loved or hated in the month of February below. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social medias if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below. I think that will do it. Hope you guys are having a really lovely day and I will just talk to you soon. Bye.